So welcome to the Sambhat today by Dr. Madhav Rao. I did not bring his bio. Uh, so I think you all know his bio, but he has a bachelor's from the University of Mumbai and a PhD from the University of Alabama. Uh, and his PhD work was on technology, uh, fabrication technology of uh, various types of integrated circuits. So I what I find interesting about him and unique about him is that he is diversified into areas which are significantly different uh, from uh, his original PhD work. So today I think he is going to present his the, that area of the that he did his PhD in more or less. The area is the same. Or, or he will expand. But now he is into uh, you know, developing embedded system systems using embedded principles, and also getting into digital design and low-power digital design. So I think that the versatility is the what is most unique about him. So, all right, Madhav. Thank you, Professor Chetan. Nice introduction. So I've been preparing for this uh, samvad, or I was thinking about this samvad session for a long time. And, huh? <laughs> No, because the reason is, I don't know what topic will be interesting to all the faculty and all the all the students. Yeah, thank you. And I thought, okay, finally I have to, you know, close in on uh, some topics which will be interesting to some set of students and probably another topic which will be interesting to some other set of students. Um, so I came up with these two topics. Yeah, I think this is the yesterday's uh, compiled version. So as Professor Chetan said, uh, my area was on uh, on the technology side. So I did my PhD in the area of uh, solder-based self-assembled 3D structures. So in 2012, when I came to the institute to give the talk, it was on that particular aspect. Uh, it was more about you know chemical etching, dry etching, uh, building deposition, photolithography, and then varying the parameters and all those things. Uh, within a year, I realized that it will be very, very difficult for me to continue doing research in this area. I'll have to depend a lot on the IAC uh, Center of Excellence in Nanoelectronics, as well as probably in IIT Bombay, Center of Excellence in Nanoelectronics and Science or something like that. And I felt that it would be very, very difficult uh, if I had to depend on the outside institutes. You know, although the IIT Bombay facilities are very, very good, they are very, very open, but that because we have a teaching load here and we don't have that routine access, a regular access to those institutes. So I had to make some time and then go there and then come back. So within a year or one and a half years, I figured it out that it will be difficult. Then so slowly started moving out into different areas. And this is where I think I got help from uh, TV as an institute. Uh, generally, kind of very, very open. So we can do whatever we want. And I figured out... Uh, uh, three topics. One is something on the 3D interconnects, one on the magnetic logic device, which my PhD student has done a lot of work. And uh, thanks to Professor Srikant and EHRC community, I think I got involved into the assistive device area. Right? Although that my background was not in those areas, but just that I got involved into it. And uh, today I'm going to pick up uh, these two topics for two extreme reasons. Uh, 3D interconnects or the interconnects modeling, I've been trying to work with the students. Till date, I have not been very, uh, have not been successful at all. Uh, not got any students come to my office and say that, okay, sir, I want to work in this area, including IM Tech, M Tech, MS, PhD, whatever it is. Uh, so that is, that's why I called it, uh, I initially wrote it as not so interesting area or very boring area. But because it's a very formal presentation, I made it into a niche area. Right? So most of the work, whatever it's been presented on the 3D interconnects, I have done myself. So whenever I got time, I used to do that. The other one is on the assistive devices. Uh, in collaboration with the EHRC center and then the NIMANS, uh, so we are able to do a lot of things. And for some reason, uh, there is a lot of interest among the student group. 
right? So my contribution to the assistive devices area is actually very, very minimal. Right, so I picked up these two topics because these were the extreme uh, interest. And then there is one more topic on magnetic logic device. I felt I will do it in the next year somewhat. Okay. So coming to the very first topic, uh, 3D interconnects. It is nothing but a wire. Right. 3D interconnects instead of a planar 2D wire, it's nothing but coming from top to bottom or bottom to top. And that's why it is called as a three dimensional because it has three dimensions, width, length, and then the height. Okay, I just wrote this as a, it's a wire and a wireless wire because most of the chips, whatever we have is, has the uh, functionality of wireless. Right? But ultimately the last mileage or the last connectivity is still the wired interconnect, which it connects the devices, right? Multiple n number of devices. So here, if I look into the evolution of this integrated circuit and then the technology and then the design, right, we have this chip which is wire bonded to the chip carrier. Right, so we have some kind, kind of functionality of the chip placed on a chip carrier and then a chip carrier will have the LEDs coming out, terminals coming out and then those particular configuration is going into the breadboard. And then we used to test that. It's kind of way back in, I think, 1970s or 60s. Okay. And uh, then comes the PCB technology, printed circuit boards, wherein we have all this chip inside a chip carrier put in a board, and then we have n such right chips mounted on the boards, and on the boards the wiring is done from one board to another board, right? So here I think you can see some four such boards, each of them probably will be connected with some kind of wires, a planar wire. Then came the next one somewhere around uh, 1995 to 2000, a system in package, right? So you mount all the, all possible chips, the functionalities of the chip, one by one, layer by layer, right? And you take out right, the wiring to the bottom of the package, the package then goes to whatever, the test benches or the breadboard, whatever you want, right. So from here to here, there is a leap of thinking that I can actually place one chip on top of the another chip, the third chip will go on top of the second chip and then so on, right. And if I want to test out the, the topmost chip, I can actually test out by having this wire connected to this particular, the package or to the substrate. Okay. Yeah, primarily to actually reduce the footprint, that's correct. Right, if I'm actually having a residential community, instead of that I want a, a tall building. Right, that's a very analog uh, way of saying, analogy of saying. Okay. So here we are reducing the footprint, but still the problem is each of this chip, right, I'm actually taking out the wire and then putting it onto the, the bottom most package. So that kind of a loop of the wire, right, creates or occupies some area, right. So the ultimate or the next generation is to have this instead of getting a loop of wire, you have a wire connected through the n number of chips, right? So you basically drill a hole and then have the wire plugged inside till it reaches to the bottommost package, right? So I'm actually saving those kind of uh, looping in wires area. Okay, clear so far. So this is one of the schematic, I have actually taken it from this particular paper or uh, this particular book I think, where these are nothing but the wires which are coming from the holes, right, to these black ones from one chip to the second one to the first one, third, second, first. So you drill a hole and then insert the wire and then you have this connectivity. 
okay so it is nothing but uh, connecting from one chip to another chip right this particular uh, the wiring can also get connected to some of these devices which are placed in the silicon substrate so if i want to uh, you know test out those one of those devices i'll have somewhere around this line okay so i'm i've used the term uh, hole and then plugging in a wire right the official term is nothing but a via it's a through silicon via this whole chip is nothing but made up of silicon substrate and i'm creating a hole right so that's why it is called a through hole and the substrate is made up of silicon so that's why it is called as a through silicon via right once the via is formed which is nothing but a hole is formed then you actually have to do deposit some material some electrical conductivity material so that i can use it for further testing for further conductivity or connectivity testing theek hai no it is still uh, micrometers the uh, the area the radius will be around around 0.5 micrometers to 1 micrometers and then the height will be around 20 micrometers let's go to the next slide so this is a scanning electron microscopy image right those were the, the previous slide was is just a schematic again taken from this particular uh, book so this is a real structure right taken from whatever layer it is this gets connected to the bottom most layer right if we look into this particular shape of the through silicon via right it is not cylindrical right it is a tapered one okay it's not cylindrical it's a non cylindrical shape okay conventionally once you make a hole once you make a via then you fill it up with copper that's been standard practice so far been followed in the integrated circuits uh, uh, this thing group right but copper has this problem of being stressed out fracture and then lot of electro migration problems So electro migration problems uh, arises when you have a lot of current density or basically a lot of current supplied across the particular wire here in this case it is a copper filled through silicon via if i supply a lot of current then it will have this lot of electro migration problems basically the material will start decomposing will start drifting towards the next layer okay so to avoid so there is one set of researchers who have proposed use a carbon nanotubes right so carbon nanotubes is nothing but a graphene material a rolled sheets of graphene right what happens if you use other metal like silver a coal silver probably would smell no i think uh, silver also has this uh, electro migration problems so silver silver aluminum in fact aluminum is a better wash and better material but uh, finally filling up silver and filling up uh, aluminum as compared to copper the technology uh, i mean the deposition technology is not as smooth as that of the copper so the industry the ic industry uh, finally went to the copper deposition via the plating process as compared to silver and aluminum i think there is electro migration as well as some kind of a voids problem in the aluminum as well as the silver gold <laughs> yeah gold is probably better gold plating is also very very standardized but i think it's very very expensive right. so carbon nanotubes is kind of uh, the kind of next generation thought whether we can actually fill up the carbon nanotubes and then have a carbon nanotubes filled through silicon via right but the problem with carbon nanotubes is If you start depositing carbon nanotube it's not a homogeneous material as such right it's a single tube right and if i want to fill up say 0.5 micron or say rather 1 micron of radius of the through silicon vias right i need to have a lot of bundles right lot of carbon nanotubes inside those particular through silicon via right and the carbon nanotubes cannot be next to each other there is some kind of called as a van der waals force 
right, which will separate them with some distance. So I'll have one carbon nanotube, right? It will be separated with some kind of a distance, 0.34 nanometers, to be in a theoretical measure, and then there will be another carbon nanotube, and then there will be one more 0.34 nanometer, and then there will be another carbon nanotube, right? So I'm not completely filling it up with the carbon nanotube material. So here is this particular tapered profile and then filling it up with the carbon nanotube. And another uh, point of carbon nanotube is it actually grows from bottom to top. So I cannot, so it needs some kind of a base region where it starts, there is a catalytic moment and then it starts to grow. Okay, I cannot actually grow this carbon nanotube somewhere on the tapered profile, somewhere on the side walls. Right. And then there is a distance between each of this carbon nanotubes. So the next proposal is what the researchers are thinking on uh, who are working on the technology is so why not have right carbon nanotubes as well as copper. Once you grow the carbon nanotubes, then you fill up the remaining portion with that of the copper. So now you have copper slash carbon nanotubes as a composite material filling the through silicon vias. Okay, so here is the geometrical diagram, right, you have a carbon nanotubes and then post this carbon nanotubes growth then you fill it up with uh, copper via the standard process of plating. So you need uh, some kind of a metal binding the carbon nanotubes. Ah, please, sir. Yeah, that is also possible. Correct, correct, correct. Um, so, whatever the tapered profile, right, it was originally designed so that the copper filling becomes easier. So because I need the copper also at this particular proposal, if it was only carbon nanotubes, it would have been made sense. Flip it and then use it. But now because we want the copper also, we will still be restricted with this tapered profile with a huge opening uh, and then a smaller bottom. Right? Yes, uh, Mandi. No, 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 nothing. So the tapering thing is uh, is a cause of a deep reactive ion etching method, which is used to uh, develop this uh, vias. Right? Let me proceed. Okay. So normally, if I have this kind of a via in the silicon, there is a region of oxide side to that particular uh, through silicon vias, right? The oxide is there just as a anti-diffusion or a diffusion barrier layer, right? If copper is there, copper might actually migrate into the nearby regions. So that's why that kind of uh, diffusion barrier is there, right? And then this region, from this region onwards, you will have the silicon substrate. So you have a silicon, bulk silicon, you made a hole, right? Besides to that, you will have some oxide region. And beyond that, it will be nothing but the silicon substrate. Okay. Right. So if I look into the cross-sectional view, this ATS we have written, right, and then I have written R, R of oxide. These are nothing but the radius. ATSV is the bottom, uh, the V is the bottom side, and then that, that is the radius of that. And R oxide is the, from this point, till the oxide region, okay. 
and then this is nothing but uh, the carbon nanotubes rather single walled carbon nanotubes cross sectional area right and even in carbon nanotubes there are two types multi walled and then single walled single walled is nothing but only one particular roll of graphene sheets in multi walled it is there will be multiple right coils of graphene So here it's a single wall. So I have drawn a single outer circle, and between the two carbon nanotubes, there is a distance of d. Yeah. Ah, yeah. this orange is it. So this is where I am going to fill up the carbon nanotubes and copper. So that will be in uh, this thing, uh, conductive material. So I just drawn it in uh, in a different color so that it looks different than that of the oxide layer. Okay. So somewhere here I have written a filling ratio. Right. This filling ratio is nothing but how much amount of copper I am depositing, right, with respect to the bottom most, the cross sectional area. right not the topmost cross sectional area the bottom most right if i have some carbon nanotubes right, then i'm going to do right uh, plate the copper so how much of that area is occupied by copper so the last one and this one right so that will be uh, defined by this twice of this radius right so it will be 2 into a of tsv no no so uh, so in between there will be a copper field right so now you have a carbon nanotubes and in between those regions whichever one is available will fill the copper okay Okay, so then I think uh, it's nothing but what we have tried to do is with this particular composite material and then a tapered profile, we have tried to model some three parameters. One is the uh, surface current density, and then the second thing is the vertical delay, and then one more is uh, we need to find out what is the power transmitted from from top to bottom and bottom to top, and if there is any kind of nearby crosstalk. Right. So these are the three uh, models we have developed, assuming that. the copper and carbon nanotubes composites are filled in the through silicon conveyors okay so we have taken the similar parameters of carbon nanotubes this is nothing but the single walled carbon nanotubes we have similar model for the multi walled also but these are the set of the the carbon nanotube single walled right and then derive whatever is the resistance of the copper right whichever i mean no based on that filling ratio of the copper we try to find out what is the resistance offered by the copper so now you have a resistance of carbon nanotubes and now you have in parallel we have a homogeneous copper the resistance offered by it so those both of them will come in parallel and then i'll be able to get right an equivalent resistance yeah somehow it uh, matches up t is a temperature again so all this material are actually a function of temperature also are they really uh, let's see no no the, this temperature will be still be at a room temperature so t will still be at uh, whatever 300 degree kelvin or what so still what happens is because the the sizes are very very small so the sizes are very very small the resistance offer will be small right so rc and d will be offering a small resistance but copper will also be offering a smaller resistance so this particular surface current density if i look into any kind of a cylindrical copper or a cylindrical material this is given by this particular equation right and the solution for this is nothing but the current density right? so 
so where k is again a constant i is some kind of a current i am actually inputting it at the top side right and then getting it from the bottom side so these are the parameters used to find the surface current density which is actually dependent on those particular model parameters and then we have tried to obtain what is the surface current density right so this is what it looks with the tapering angle what is the surface current density and then with the filling ratio what is the surface current density okay so with the filling ratio 0% represents zero copper it is completely filled by carbon nanotubes right 100% represents the other extreme which is completely filled by copper there is no carbon nanotubes okay so in between there is some ratios which means it is copper as well as carbon nanotubes together right so if this particular black line is nothing but the 0% right which indicates at the surface of the through silicon vias if i probe in what is the current density it more or less remains the same there is a small dip here if i ignore that particular dip it is more or less kind of a homogeneous if i come back to some other particular filling ratios this one the bottom most this surface current density value is different than that of this particular surface current density value right so if i have 100% of copper completely copper i will actually get inconsistent surface current density which is actually not good what it means is at the extremes right of the through silicon vias the current surface current density is more it is likely to pass more current at the center of the wire or the interconnect it is passing or it is having a very less current density right which is actually attributed to the skin effects of a regular copper but with having a carbon nanotubes right we can see that it is actually reduced so in between if i have copper and carbon nanotubes it is much less so it is in between that of the 0% copper and 100% of the copper right so similarly with the tapering angle if i have more taper there is more likely of copper to be deposited on the side walls and then resulting it in more kind of skin effects problem that means i will have more inconsistent surface current density so that is what we extract from this particular models and this is also been verified to some of the extreme conditions like the 0% copper and then the 100% of copper so if i have two of this color through silicon vias and then a copper slash carbon nanotubes composites filled into this through silicon vias right then the circuit the equivalent circuit or the model circuit looks like something like this right there is a resistance offered by the carbon nanotubes there is a resistance offered by the copper right there is a self inductance because the current is actually looping in i'll get some inductance right and then there is an effective capacitance here because there is an oxide this particular through silicon vias can be modeled right as a mos capacitor okay so something i think the vlsi student should be able to understand so i have a capacitance i have a resistance so this is what the equivalent r resistance capacitance inductance and then a conductance models looks like So once I have this equivalent RLGC model, then I want to understand if a power is initiated at port one, how much of power is received at the port two for different filling ratios of the copper. Okay, and then similarly, there is another concept called uh, one is the transmission power, another one is the reflection one. Right, so if some power is initiated here out of 
that power which is initiated it will actually get reflected also back to the same port right so there is an s11 parameter and then there is an s12 or s21 parameter right so from this particular diagram if i draw it on a decibel levels right what it indicates is right a higher proportion of copper a higher filling ratio of copper in that particular composite is actually better to transmit from port 1 to port 2 or to, from port 2 to port 1 and the reflection in the same particular port will also be less right so in the initial slide in the previous slide we said that the surface current density was inconsistent right if i have more copper right in this particular slide what we are saying is having a more copper is actually beneficial in transmitting the powers from one port to another port so there is a trade off so you'll have to choose effectively what should be the filling ratio while we are designing the interconnect for a particular application right and yeah no these are all modeled ones right and then we compared this result with that of some of the uh, literatures right uh, where they have done studies using particular software and soft software right so this is a quick approximation models so what it uh, say if i have very high current density right then it is actually going to have the current flow or the current path from the exterior right that what it means is this particular point compared to any other point in between is the current is going to flow at the extreme sides right at the extreme uh, walls of the two silicon wires all right so if i have a very high amount of current it is likely to break this particular region right so so we have to make a choice whether we are interested in supplying a very high current then if at all it is then i want a more homogeneous this thing current density where the current will be actually be equally be spread right across the surface so there is one thing so i want a very high current so that my delay will be reduced so in that case you choose that and in other case if i want the power to be transferred completely then you choose the more of the copper right so then we had uh, one more delay vertical delay model right using the same set of model equations right we applied the elmore delay concept right so there is something called as an elmore delay in the uh, vlsi so we use utilize the same thing right and then come up with this two equations to find out the filling ratios and that of the delay right here also we can say that the filling ratio the better the filling ratio the more the copper it is the better it is even for the delay right so on one side i have a surface current density right on on the other side i'll have to have a trade off on the delay as well as the power to be transferred from one to the second port right yeah so this is the, i think the end of my part 1 which is i felt i mean all all the work has been done by me uh, because there was no student interest among this i felt even when i was speaking uh, i initially felt that there is not much interest so but this part is over now if you have any questions please let me know and then i think there will be more uh, exciting part in the part uh, what this particular equation is it uh, this this particular equation is it i just used the 
No, I think I just had this expression and put it on MATLAB to get the answers for different uh, parameters. So I had to load uh, different values of C load, and then C effective was calculated from the the diameters and all. Okay, so some of the results are actually published, and if you want to have more details, this thing, uh, this is only a, just a snapshot. So you can go to that particular ECDC conference and then VLSID design conference. Okay. okay, so the second part is on the assistive devices. Uh, here, I think I should thank Professor Srikant uh, and the HRC team to, you know, to get that collaboration uh, with that of Nimans, and he made it possible. And uh, I should also thank the set of EC students, IM Tech EC students, uh, who started at the same time, 2015 batch. Right? We had an IM Tech in IT initially. Only in 2015, we got the batch of the uh, IM Tech in EC. Right? Without which, it would not be possible. The, all the next set of slides not be possible. So this particular slide is very motivating for me. Actually, I captured it from uh, this human engineering uh, research lab, HURL, they call it as HURL, in, from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, the three students, uh, these are four graduate students. Okay. Uh, I think he has this dis disability. He developed this particular device and he uses it for his uh, daily activities while going to the lab and then coming to the lab. The other three sets of the students, right, uh, are just watching, right. This guy with his handicap or whatever disability, he has still developed this particular system for himself. He's a graduate student in University of Pittsburgh, right, electrical uh, engineering department, right. And that's why I feel very, very motivating to see. This is not that someone else has developed this device, and has put it on this particular student or this person. This is actually developed by this particular person. I'm, I actually met him in uh, when I went to University of Pittsburgh uh, in 2015 or 16. Okay, and then I saw this particular one and then captured it and thought I'll present this in the, in the today's summer. Okay, so we have developed a series of assistive devices and then somewhat uh, the surgical also. But uh, the lab name, we have called it as Surgical and Assistive Robotics Lab. It's too ambitious at this point of time. I'd rather be very, very safe on saying that it's an assistive robotics lab. But I think at some point of time, we have to be very, very ambitious so as to you know, go to the, proceed to the next level. So it was initiated somewhere around 2016 January. And as I said, the same, at the same time, the inflow of IM Tech EC students were also there. And that got aligned. And then I think we were able to develop uh, some set of devices. So here is the one set of device. Uh, so one of the problems which the demand faculty told us or shared with us is there is a huge number of patients right, waiting to get access to some physiotherapy exercising tool. Right? They have, Nimans has a static version of a rehabilitation or the uh, physiotherapy exercising device, which is actually imported from Germany, costs very, very, uh, very, 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 very expensive. Uh, but the queue time is such that uh, the patient has to wait for a month or one and a half months to get access to it. And then these patients are actually coming, right? They have this kind of a post-stroke, uh, they have a stroke, and then they get surgery, and then they go back to their uh, homes, and then they have to come back, right, for this particular uh, exercises. Right, rehabilitation exercises. So the waiting time or the queuing time is very, very prolonged. Right? So the Niemann doctors were suggesting whether we can actually develop a portable and then a wearable device which we can actually issue it to those patients so that they can take it to their home and then they can do the exercises. Right? So this was the problem statement. So when I, uh, my IM tech student, so I told the shared this particular problem to him. So he came up with this particular pulley systems, an array of pulley systems, right? 
the array of pulley systems will individually actuate each of the joints of the fingers right each of the joints right the wrist the thumb and we plan to have it on the other set of upper limb also right so let me see if i can run the video so this is again programmable so somewhere at the other end there is a controller and if i actually press one or two it will uh, lift the index finger the middle finger and then so on so all the electronics or the 3d printed parts were actually mounted on a variable glove on a glove basically right so the hand is at rest is it very in a loose position and then based on the the programmable controller it actually actuates it activates the the dc motors and pulls the fingers one by one pulls yeah ha huh. correct 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 yeah so that is something we are actually doing uh, the next slide i'll talk about the emg sensors so based on the muscle activity we are trying to develop a system which will provide you know how much torque should be provided correct so but that is not yet done this is very very uh, uh, i'll say that it's a very preliminary uh, primitive form of a variable uh, assistive device correct so if i have to calibrate or characterize a trapezoidal profile and then use those points okay okay so we have tried uh, different uh, this thing uh, threads also different material threads uh, which thread has a more capability so the i think the, the most recent work on this is uh, developing an uh, emg array of electrodes to find out what is the muscle activity right and then relate that to the individual joints movements right and this is where uh, i think i and vinay will require some help from the, uh, the ml group okay so we don't know as such you know because the individual part of the muscle group could be mapped to different finger movements right so if i'm placing an electrode here it don't need not necessarily that to have it is mapped to only the index finger it could be mapped to a middle finger it could be mapped to a thumb certain other fingers correct right. so this is just a recent work where the electronics has been done and then we have got some emg signals yeah yeah so there are two lines uh, blue and uh, the uh, orangeish right these are dual channel emg electrodes so we have placed uh, uh two electrodes basically and then getting the data so one uh, as you see here uh, this is one set of so it's a differential signal so one set of uh, sensor will give me a blue line the another set of sensor will give me another one. so the differential signal is uh, much better compared to a you know a single one is because it just eliminates it helps in eliminating the noise well studied yeah correct sir no the, the no so i think uh, if the electrodes see the, the the dimension of electrodes is actually huge if suppose somehow we can get the electrodes which is very very localized you know of 
some micrometer then i think it becomes very very easy to map it right here but we have we are playing with a larger scale so i think there are too many figures here so i'll explain in one by one so let's look at this figure first and then go to this figure and then go to this figure okay uh, so this is some work we are doing on the lower limb part uh, again i think vinay is working on this so the problem is uh, it's kind of a very common problem i've seen so in a long uh, flights the passengers feel uh, some kind of a numbness in their leg that is nothing but a blood clotting problem also medically termed as a deep vein thrombosis right the bleeding the blood doesn't flow if if you are uh, having this leg you know if it's not if you are not walking for a longer time right the problem becomes uh, very very uh, what do you say very very tragic if suppose a patient is lying on the bed right and a surgery is performed on the patient right for a long hours and the patient doesn't move his leg at all then someone from the doctor's group or the nurse should have actually have to move his leg right instead of that whether we can develop an automated right a moving leg moving machine which will resolve this particular problem right so to avoid this dvt problem a very simple solution right this particular device if you can actually move the ankle right i'll show you the video first okay just actually moves the ankle uh, the leg over the ankle region right so this has to be automated right this has to be automated with respect to the ecg signal right so so that it will allow us to be in alignment with that of the blood flowing and then recovering at the some some portion so that's why to just do a preliminary study what we have done is a thermal images on this leg portion right the thermal images shows that if there is a blood here there will be some temperature difference as compared to no blood there is some temperature difference right but we have to do some more things on that particular thermal images some more image processing and all right the other thing is if you can see here it's the same device as that of here on the left side but there is a blood pressure cuff right integrated into this particular lower limb device so what the blood pressure cuff is nothing but it is going to inflate and then deflate right if the leg this thing lower limb device is actually helping the leg to move right towards this portion this is going to inflate it is going to apply more pressure onto the leg and then when this particular portion is going back or restoring its original position the blood pressure cuff is going to release it so that inflation and deflation cycle is likely to continue during this actuation mechanism which is likely to promote and avoid the blood clotting problems they are trying to pump in more kind of the blood flow right and this is actually done by nothing but off the shelf stepper motor so this is one device on the lower part <coughs> and uh, we have one more called the ventricular assistive device again to help in the promoting the blood flow in the heart right in the weakened portion of the heart okay. if suppose someone is having a weak heart right the blood actually doesn't come out right or wherever it is supposed to be and then doesn't come inside the heart also for the regular circulation so the plan is during this particular ecg cycle right from r to t peaks if somehow it could be at the ventricular regions of the heart if you can apply the pressure right and then release it from t to r peak right that will be useful in promoting the blood flow 
from the in the inside in, uh, into the heart and then out of the heart right only for the weakened uh, weak portions of the uh, only for the weak heart so here is a here is a very rudimentary level of the work so what we have done is this is a 3d printed uh, rigid heart it's not as flexible as we wanted it's kind of very very rigid a balloon is actually wrapped around the the heart model and then the balloon actually inflates and then deflates right which is supposed to apply the pressure onto the lower portion of the heart and then release it right and then we want it to be in sync with that of the ecg signal so there should be somewhere the ecg uh, sensor will be there it's going to collect the ecg signal and then from that collection it is going to align this particular inflation and deflation cycle right so all this electronics and then whatever uh, there is a reservoir here those things are there so as to make it in alignment which is very very easier right so here is a set of signals what it says is during the systole right i am applying a pressure right during the diastole i have to release it so the pressure is getting released okay all other things all the other two graphs are nothing but the valve opening and then closing right so prajwal and mtech uh, student did a thesis on this particular work yes professor Yeah. I mean, what is the uh, what is the next mechanism that will make sure that you know, the second uh, no yeah, i don't have an answer professor shridhar uh, so what so what we do is we develop the system and then uh, we leave it to professor shrikant and dr vikas from nimesh <laughs> <laughs> so we we uh, we went to different uh, this thing uh, companies like tata alexi and all we went and showcased this but they are also you know in a similar state whether it will be used surgically or so previous one ha it has been not So, uh, so we have these devices even in US. Some of these devices should be there. Uh, they are very, very costly. So, for the Indian market, I think it is still not applicable at a mass scale. So, I'll, uh, proceed to the next device. Uh, so, I think I thought I should show the video, but then anyway, if if it comes, I'll show you. So, the next device is an hyper flexible probe. Right. So, what we wanted was a kind of a high degree of maneuverability. right just like a snake with high degree of freedoms right to be inserted right the actual aim is to actually use that particular probe as a single port invasive probe so as to do some kind of a tumor removal in the large intestine or the small intestine or as well as see uh, some kind of a neurological problems and if there is a tumor in the brain so the single port uh, device should uh, should be able to locate the particular tumor with high degree of maneuverability and then come back to its original position right so i'll show you the video first so this is a small prototype of some five elements this particular region is an endoscopic camera we have mounted it on uh, the series of elements right so it has actually moved uh, with these two elements it is moving up and then the rest of them are in the same position and then now it is actually moving laterally or it should move laterally and this is the video feed so all this five elements are actually done by this individual elements right which are actually 3d printed You can see that there is three slots, 
right? There are basically three holes, right? If I place one particular entity on top of the another entity, the topmost entity should have some flexibility, right? I should be able to have some pulley system, a thread going to the top, right? From the bottommost entity. So that's why that particular slots are there. And then there's a thread which goes through this particular slots and then ties up with that of the topmost entity, right? And then it will be able to pull using that particular thread system, it will be able to pull that particular topmost entity. And similarly, all other entities has its individual pulley systems so that it will be able to pull irrespective of the other entities. So individual entity here, the five of them, whatever we have developed, has an individual capacity of right moving in X and Y positions. Yeah, uh, no, good question, Professor. So the current endoscopy is at least a two-port incisive device. So if I want to locate a tumor somewhere in the small intestine or a large intestine, so one has to actually have a probe, endoscopy probe in one side. And the another one, they have to apply some surgical tool and then have to direct that particular probe to reach to this particular position of the tumor. So the here, the, the idea here is, or the aim here is to have a single port, make a single insertion, and then reach towards that particular tumor. Right. Currently, it is a simple form of a probe. Right. What Dr. Vikas suggests is to have the surgical tool also in this particular opening. A surgical tool inside that particular uh, hyperflexible probe, so it should go to that particular, reach to that particular tumor, and then whatever cut or drill, and then suck, and then take it out. Right, so the dimension should be less than 6 mm. So here I think uh, it is in centimeters. So that is, that is the problem with most of the devices. Right, someone has to scale it down. I have not looked into mathematics at all. So we have used uh, off the shelf this thing and then try to pull the system. Ah, right, right, right. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, you may have to choose. Correct, correct. Right, right, that is that, yeah. I think we have to look into all those things, but still at a very preliminary stage. So someone has to do a thesis of it. So the whole point of this summer is to, you know, attract the students to come and do the M-Tech thesis or IM-Tech thesis. <laughs> right. So I think this work was done by, again, the IM-Tech EC student, Arvind. I think he's not here today. Uh, so this is a footwear in the form of, uh, I think it's a, I'll call it this as a chappal and then a socks and then again, again a flippers. Yes. yes. Some of them uh, d doesn't exist, and some of them do exist, but it's a very high price. So, what we are taking an aim is to have all this cater to the Indian patients, whether it is uh, yeah low cost, and even if it is available, why not make it uh, low cost? And uh, some of them probably is not at all there. Right. So, the another slide I, which I'll talk about the Braille device. Braille device is actually there. What we are trying to do is uh, with uh, some different technology it is possible. So I think I have some more slides. Uh, so this particular Parkinson PD patients has this uh, unique problem of uh, freezing while they are walking. Somewhere they tend to freeze, right? And if they are in that particular freeze state for a longer time, right, they tend to fall. 
right, and then have their injuries all around the faces, and, right. So a simple solution with the, the Niemann's faculty, what they provided was, can you develop a kind of a footwear system, right, some kind of, kind of a variable system where if you can identify that they are stopping, they are in a freezing position, right, you provide some cue, provide some cue in the form of a light, provide some cue in the form of a vibratory this thing and uh, provide an audio cue also you know just in an audio just say say that walk 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 just kind of provide that kind of a hint right so this electronics is actually does that so it has a kind of some kind of a pressure sensor right it uh, determines whether it is in a whether they are in a freezing state based on but that particular freezing state you have a laser diodes which will uh, have a light on their path and then the light itself place as a cue so that they can move their steps across that particular line okay and then uh, I think all the three of them have the uh, this thing uh, audio cue also so there is a speaker somewhere uh, which is connected to the system and I don't know what what which version is a wired one or which version is a wireless version but I think the students who have developed it knows about it okay. Uh, uh, normally walking and stopping. No, this is actually applied to only those patients. So whenever they are stopping, that means that they are in that particular freezing position, right? And it is used only for the clinical practices. So when they are doing that particular exercises, you know, just walking is one such exercises. So it is still not, you know, gone, gone to the outdoor. So I have a video, I'll probably show it later because I want to run through some of the other exciting videos. Uh, this is a very recent work Sriram has done. Uh, it's nothing but a drilling tool. It's a CNC drill. Okay. Based on the joystick, you can actually move to a particular position, X and Y position, and it actually drills a hole. Okay. And then, uh, so this is the drilling tool, and then this is the suction tool. So once it is completely drilled, it has to suck, it has to take it and then move it into some other region. Right. The aim here is to do this particular activity, drilling as well as the uh, you know, taking it inside a liquid, right? Inside the liquid, in the sense, this has to be op uh, used during the surgery. So suppose it is uh, used in some kind of a you know brain kind of a surgery. The drilling will be useful to have some kind of a hole in the skull, and then it should reach whatever the the region of tissues, suck some region of the tissues, and then place it somewhere, and then our uh, snake or the hyperflexible probe can actually reach to other regions. So that is the aim. Okay. So the currently, so this is a basically a bone. I just placed it on the photo just to use, just to show that, okay, it can drill that particular bone. Okay. I'll show you this video. It's nothing but, uh, it's not as exciting as the other one, I think, but I think it took a lot of time. It took a lot Initially, of effort. the drill bit is positioned for the location where we want to start drilling using the joystick. We can fix the height of the drill, that is the Z axis, and we can control the X and Y axis according to the shape we wanted to drill. We can move the device both in linear and in curvilinear coordinates. Object is then taken to the required location using the joystick. No, no, so the doctor has to have uh, two ports again. One somewhere he will drill, and then some other region he will have to, you know, pull that particular muscle, make some room, and then dug in deep. Right? What we are trying to do is have it in as an integrated system, 
drill it, suck the region and move it apart and then once again go inside that particular drill region. So the plan is to integrate this as well as the hyperflexible probe together. So very very ambitious. Huh? No, the actually the budget is zero. <laughs> no, yeah, yes, just is. Correct, correct. Yes, yes. Okay. No, right, right. So this is just for the demonstration purpose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know what should be the, uh, what is the expected, anticipated cost of this overall device. <laughs> Okay, so let's. So again, this is one more uh, an assistive device uh, for the visually impaired. Uh, it's a regular uh, six-pin Braille device. Right? Um, there are six pins. The six pins has to vibrate. Right? That's the ideal this thing. So there are existing devices which actually uses the vibrator motors to actually move the pin up and down. Right? Here we have tried to use an electromagnetic technology. Right? And then try to vibrate the pins. So again, it is programmable, so I can actually see one of the pins or two of the pins kind of vibrating. And here, I think one pin is vibrating at a different frequency. So I can program which of the pins can vibrate at whatever frequency. Okay. So here I think the two pins are vibrating and probably three pins. Okay. So this device which we had developed, uh, it's a very very rudimentary form and I think uh, we tested this on uh, our student uh, Vidya and uh, I think uh, she didn't like that much to be really frank because uh, she says that it is, I cannot touch all the six pins at the same time and if I can, if the device has that capability that all the six pins can be pursued at the same time, then the reading becomes faster, right? What uh, so what Vidya tested was individual pins of the six pins, and then recognize the alphabet, whatever A or B or whatever. She was able to recognize that, but it is not as fast as she would have liked. So there is still more work to be done. Okay, I don't have this particular device. Uh, so there is one more thing uh, which we are doing with Vision Empower Company, incubated in IIITB, which is a tactile uh, uh, educational tool. And this will be the last video. So these are the set of lessons, a biology lessons. If a visually impaired person touches this, it's, it will speak out the contents. Okay. If this is a cell, I think it will. If this is a cell or whatever nucleotide, it will speak out the contents of the cell or whatever is the nucleotide. Right. So that is what we did the experiment with uh, again Vidya, and then she was very happy with this particular device. So, so we have uh, done a various set of devices, assistive devices, and then trying to move into the surgical uh, prototypes also. Uh, huh. Yes, yes, we have uh, some methodology, some directions now. Okay, so I'll uh, stop this. Yeah.
Okay. So all these things are possible. Assisted devices as well as my 3D interconnects work and then somewhere uh, magnetic logic devices are possible only because of the IIITB students. And as I said, the community of IIITB, a um, lot of freedom in, in the institutes. Right? I can choose different areas also. Right? And but a special thanks to this set of students uh, who has made it possible. Right? And, uh, and to the EHRC center which made uh, we work with the Nimans faculty. That particular, uh, uh, the handshaking was actually initiated by the HRC center, right? So I think I'm uh, done for today. So if you have any questions, any discussions, let me know. How many of you are actually excited with this work, whatever we are doing or it is, or do you suggest we should not do this? Yes, one day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is a braille alphabet. So if you have seen a static braille device, they can actually uh, perceive that as an alphabet and then they actually rub through the uh, through a static page and then they can can perceive a sentence or a line or whatever. Right. So what we are trying to do is a programmable and a refreshable uh, braille pins. Sir, is there a way for the like, people to do all Google and practical Yeah, I think the Vision Empower company has uh, that kind of a goal in their mind, but I think we I have not reached at that stage. They can actually answer you, you know, they can actually pursue a mathematical equations on. Yeah. One else, right, right. Yeah, the, yeah, I think I was in that opinion that the same six pins will be programmed to a different over a period of time. Over a, correct, correct, correct. But I think ideally, I think we need more arrays of the bridge pins. Yes, Samit. Go ahead. So the about So we need to identify which muscle uh, maps to which set of muscles or the group of muscles maps to that particular finger. So I suppose, uh, as Professor Sridhar said, pr probably that particular finger is not so deformed then I need to, need not have to apply so much of torque or force to bend it. So suppose that particular finger is a very normal, you know, very active. Then I don't need to apply that much of torque at all. Right. So that I should be able to map it from my muscle uh, signals. So EMG signals basically. So can I, but because our electrodes are of a different size, right, if I actually place it on my hand, I should be, I am actually getting lot of muscle group signals. Right, instead of say one or two muscles signals. So that is where I think we have a group of data and then we want to localize it uh, to, to one particular finger. So that is where I felt uh, this neural networks or whatever the AI techniques will help us. Huh? Uh, the, the EMG signals, is it? So EMG signals normally are uh, conventionally applied onto this regions. So even we tried with this region also, but it, it it's more of a bone signals than are of the uh, the muscle signals. And EMG doesn't work in this regions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that's a good estimate. 
five percent, I'll say. But I mean, we need that infrastructure. I mean, with the EHRC now, I think uh, we are slowly getting into you know 3D printing technology, uh, trying to get a lathe machine next uh, and a portable bench top a lathe machine, CNC machine. So we need to. I mean, there's still a long way to go to, and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So the, the the question then comes is uh, if we are leveraging their facilities, so what is that we are doing? So are we just putting pouring the ideas to the IIT Bombay and IIT Delhi? Then. Uh, Within Bangalore. And if you can leverage on that, then maybe, uh, for example, the phone devices that you have to use, from that to uh, a prototype, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, there are available uh, FAP spaces, maker spaces, all those things are available in Bangalore. Um, it's just that if we have to come to a common point where whether the institute triple IDB is ready to share the IP with them, then I think it becomes easier for them to fabricate. Uh, so that is still I have not worked out. Uh, correct, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the the path so the path we are trying to take is whether can we convince any uh, Tata Electrics or any product companies will be interested, then uh, they can take this and make it a large scale instead of uh, going to you know maker space where we develop the devices ourselves and then we don't know what to do you know whether we have to do a large scale or mass scale or a small scale. So that is the path we are trying to take. Correct, correct. I don't know, maker space allow more specific space to keep around. Right, right, right. Definitely, definitely. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Black box, yes. Uh, the idea of particular technology is to put it in abstracted form. I certainly believe in uh, whatever you said. Uh, so the technology should not only be uh, looked into. You know, we should not move forward only with the technology. Maybe this technology has to be looked into. I think I should talk more with uh, Amit and the group so as to come up with this holistic view. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's always a notion whether the technology should drive the, you know, the policy, social policies, or the policy, or the other way. The lower limb, right? So we have to have uh, in phase so that the, when the blood is going out, it should be compressed, uh, going out of the that portion, and then it should come the actuator, uh, the the what is that? The lower limb, the sole part should come towards that particular. So that has to be in phase. And uh, though both the things, both the moments has to be in phase with that of the systole and diastole period of the ECG signal. Correct, correct. So for the leg thing, right? Yeah, that is there. So the yes, yes. So the actuation, uh, we are not able to move it very, very fast as that of the ECG signal. No, ECG just ECG or SPO2 signal just tells us what is the blood flow at uh, blood flow rate. So and then it will probably will be able to calibrate or characterize the peaks of the signals. So at that particular peak, we should be having some position. So probably what uh, what you are saying is we'll not be able to do at that rate, but every tenth of that cycle will we be able to reach that state. That's just enough. Now the actuation of the lower limb with that of the ECG is 72 beats uh, per minute. No? So wait, this one takes more than a second. Now with our limited uh, zero budget capabilities. <laughs> 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 so what are we here from students? Should we continue doing this work or it's not so interesting? Let's move on to some other things. Thanks. So thanks for your time.